everyone, my name is Kirsten Tynan and I'm director of the Fully Informed Jury Association. Today we are joined by Eric Haley, a FIJA activist and also former grand jury foreman in Texas. Hi Eric, how are you today? <laughs> I'm doing great. How are you doing? <laughs> great. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to give a little background of some recent changes in Texas grand jury history, because I think you're one of the, the first jurors uh, post the pick a pal system. Uh, Texas. Yes. OK, yeah. Texas, I think in 2015, changed the way they picked grand jurors. Previously, they had this system where the judge appointed someone who was a buddy of his who then appointed specific people to be grand jurors which is quite interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. But uh, now they're they're picked more or less randomly. So I guess let's start with that as my first question. How did you get on the grand jury and become a grand jury foreman? Uh, it, it was pretty random, like you're saying, which I think is a lot better way to do it instead of someone getting recommended to it. But um, I just, I got a regular jury summons in the mail and didn't know if it was going to be grand jury or what. Uh, and then I went in um, and there was a pool of potential jurors, probably around a hundred people, maybe a little bit more. And they asked some questions um, to the whole group. Like if you had, you know, um, conflicts with work or medical problems, because they did say it was going to be every Thursday for six months. So, uh, once they asked that, they kind of divided the room in half, the people that really couldn't and then uh, the people that could. And I ended up in the uh, the smaller pool, the people uh, that could do it. And the judge just randomly called my name first. <laughs> and um, I had actually read all the questions on – or the surviving board deer on the FIJA website and was prepared for it, all the questions. But – Actually, he just asked me um, one question. He said, have you ever been convicted of any kind of crime? And I said, yes. And he asked me if it was theft. And I said, no. And he's like, okay, you're the first uh, member of our grand jury and you're the uh, foreman. And so I was really <laughs> excited about it. Try not to show that uh -huh. I was really excited. Nice. But yeah, that's basically it. It was pretty random. Okay. So um, definitely the length and frequency of service is different from a trial jury. Um, what are some of the other differences between that and trial jury service? Um, one of the main ones, I would say, um, to me, since it's kind of become so controlled by the prosecution, it's almost like a practice run for them before the trial to see what people are going to ask, what kind of questions, to see what kind of, how good of an argument they have. Uh, also, as far as jury nullification, um, on a trial jury, you know, it only takes one person to be able to hang the jury. Um, with a grand jury, there's true bill, no bill, or you can pass the case for more information. To true bill it for it to proceed to the trial jury, um, you need at least nine people to vote true bill out of the 12 people. And for a no bill, for it to be just done right there, um, you need at least four jurors. Mm -hmm. So that, well, that's not the only two main differences, but also you don't really have a, um, a defense attorney there for the person that's being charged with the crimes. So those would be the main differences. So that's interesting. It sounds like it's basically a dry run for the prosecution, but the defense doesn't get that same advantage. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you're you basically mm -hmm. only hearing from the arresting officers, the prosecuting district attorney, and every now and then you'll get a defense packet, but you don't really have time to read it, mm -hmm. and they encourage you <laughs> not to read it. <laughs> <laughs> And just for, for the benefit of those in our audience who don't know, uh, basically this portion of the criminal prosecution is not determining whether the defense is guilty or the defendant is guilty or innocent, but only whether or not there is enough evidence to proceed to trial. Um, and so right. you can be indicted, but it 
you know, you could still be acquitted by a jury um, or, you know, have a hung jury or something. Um, so for that reason, uh, part, that's part of the reason why ostensibly the um, burden is lower in the grand jury. Um, now, I know in some states uh, there's more than one grand jury going on at a time. Do you know, were you guys the only grand jury uh, for that court at the time or were there others? In Collin County, they have two going at a time, one at the beginning of the week and one at the end. Mm -hmm. and that was the one at the end of the week. Okay, interesting. I, I know there's a phenomenon called grand jury shopping where if a grand jury refuses to true bill a, uh, an indictment, the prosecutors can just bring it back to another grand jury and try, you know, try with a different set of people. Do you know if, uh, if it's like a one and done situation in Texas or if that, you know, if they can try again? Um, I'm not sure on the specifics of it, but I do know that we saw some cases that other grand juries had seen previously but they uh, changed the charges oh, on it. Interesting. So yeah, they weren't being charged the same thing, I guess, because that'd be okay. double jeopardy. But yeah, it actually per Supreme Court precedent right now, it actually wouldn't be double jeopardy because um, okay. they they say double jeopardy attaches when the trial jury is sworn in. So basically, anything that happens before that is not considered double jeopardy. Okay. You were, you were considered wow, not to okay. have been in jeopardy yet, <laughs> which I will say is very wow. interesting and certainly not something that we agree with, <laughs> but yeah. for informational purposes, <laughs> that's one of the, one of the many insane. tricks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <Wow. laughs> so um, now... How many cases did you do in a, in a day? How long was your day? Like, what was the, how much time per case were you able to spend? Um, it depended on the day and the cases that we were doing. But, and I was there for six months. And over that six months, uh, we did just over a thousand cases. Um, on an average day, we'd be there usually somewhere between probably five, six hours a day. And we did usually between 30 to 40 cases a day. And so it doesn't give you very much time on each case. It usually somewhere between like maybe three to 10 minutes at the most on each case. And they push it through really fast. And actually the very first case that we were doing, I, um, I didn't even realize that it started yet because they didn't really give us any kind of instructions or anything how this was going to go. And then once they asked if there was any questions on that case and they started talking about it the next one i was like or the next one i was like oh okay so we're actually doing this right now and that was it like <laughs> what <laughs> so do you decide right then or do you then do you hear them all and then go deliberate or how does that work yeah the, you go through the whole docket hearing um all the cases presented and then um yeah you do the deliberations afterwards so it's really important to take notes on each one too because you probably won't remember oh wow what they were about. Wow. Yeah. If there's some clicking on this interview, it's because I just brought up the calculator and did a little math. Uh, for a five hour day at 40 cases, that would be seven and a half minutes a case, which is actually pretty good compared to some that I've seen. I'm not saying it's good in the uh, <laughs> absolute sense, <laughs> but just for comparison, wow. in 2011, I came across an article that was writing up a North Carolina grand jury that did 276 cases in a day. They spent an average of 52 seconds per case. That Whoa. is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even and know what, how that's what state legal. Was that? that was North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Man. Uh, <laughs> Perhaps when I when I post this, I'll put a, a link in the description if I remember. But I was just like quite appalled. <laughs> it's really ridiculous, <laughs> and most people have no idea. They don't realize that. You know? <laughs> right, right, and and it kind of seems to me like it reflects a a callousness and maybe like a casualness about the the prosecution. What was what was kind of the prosecutor's demeanor through all of this? Were, were they like 
hard nose and serious about it? What, like, did they just kind of expect you to rubber stamp it? How did that, what was your, what was the environment like? Yeah, for the prosecutors, um, they were very casual. Uh, the very first day, uh, I remember the district attorney was sitting there laughing about the, the people being prosecuted. He's like, oh, this is another frequent flyer of ours. And they're like, it's okay to laugh. We need some comic relief. But yeah, they really don't really see these people as real people. It seems like the real lives, and um, it, it was just really bizarre to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they just act like uh, the grand jury is almost like a rubber stamp or just another you know, arm of the state. We're there for just the technicality of it because they have to have it there, mm-hmm. you know. And actually, they literally made me and the vice foreman rubber stamps <laughs> to <laughs> sign subpoenas and indictments <laughs> but to speed up the process. Wow. Which I never used. <laughs> <laughs> well, good for you. That's <laughs> that's discouraging. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, another uh, another interesting feature I've seen of grand juries in some states is that the rules are different if, say, a police officer is being um, prosecuted. Did you get any cases that involved police or other government officials, and did that differ either officially or sort of unofficially? Was it treated differently? Yes. Actually, we had one of the uh, high-profile cases, if anybody remembers, the Eric Case Bolt case um that happened in mckinney texas the craig ranch pool party uh the video went viral um everybody was pretty much calling for the police officer's head um but and i don't know exactly how much i could say about it but they did treat it differently which i i think was good um they had the fbi and um they, they basically had a special prosecutor show up instead of the usual district attorneys and stuff that were there. Uh, I think it was the Texas Rangers and FBI and some other prosecutor come in. So they did mm-hmm. treat it differently. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think it's Georgia where like they're allowed, the, def- the defense is allowed to be present if they're a police officer and they are allowed to make a statement to the grand jury if they want to and things like that. And it was like, huh. Well, that may be good, but we're not all getting that, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. And, def- and witnesses come in to testify in front of the grand jury makes a huge difference and makes people realize that these are real people with real lives, too. Mm-hmm. So. How often do witnesses actually testify? It sounds like at seven and a half minutes a case, there's not a lot of witness time for the most part. There's not um, hardly ever, like maybe a couple times a month out of all those cases that we did. But that is one good thing to do if you are the foreman or on the grand jury. um, Try to subpoena witnesses as much as possible so people know that this is not just a a name on a docket. Mm -hmm. Uh, Okay, so that's a great uh, segue into one of my questions, which is basically... Um, since you're not, a, it's not, it's not a situation where a single person can hang the grand jury. <laughs> you need people right. to agree with you. Um, so what are your tips for like winning others over to join you and not indicting so that you can get that uh, minimum amount to nullify? Do you openly discuss jury nullification? Do you take another angle? How do you, how do you recommend <clears throat> people deal with that? Well, when I first started, um, I was going more of the angle of kind of openly talking about it without saying the words jury nullification. And um, I would basically try to logically argue with them about how, you know, this is a victimless crime and uh, it's going to destroy their whole life if they have a felony on the record to impact their family and communities and stuff. But that didn't really work. Um, they're like, well, they, you know, they broke the law. What kind of message would we be sending to them if we did that? And uh, so I figured out the best way to go about it is to get them to really see it for themselves. Um, 
<clears throat> whenever a case is being presented to the grand jury, you have the usually the arresting officer, prosecuting district attorney, and you can ask questions the entire time. So I would ask a bunch of questions like about the constitutionality of the police's actions, um, the probable cause, um, if they were searching somebody, and all the details about that, um, how they obtain the evidence. Um, also, yeah, like I said, call in witnesses. Um, also, it helps to know the personalities of the other jurors, if you have time to figure that out, uh, to know what kind of questions to ask that might kind of not sit well with them when they get the answers to them. Um, yeah, ask questions about, you know, how it's going to affect families and communities. Do they have people depending on them? What's going to happen if they go to jail, you know, to other people and make sure to you know, take notes too. Mm -hmm. Now, how often did you find yourself in the minority without, you know, without enough people to pre prevent an indictment? Was that really like, most of the time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Was it like lone holdout, Eric, or did you have a buddy or two, maybe? <laughs> oh, that's that's another thing too. Like, you, as far as asking questions, you don't want to do it too much because you don't want to annoy the other jurors and you don't want to make any kind of enemies. Um, there were a couple of other jurors on there that I really liked because they were asking a lot of good questions and not just blindly going with what the prosecution wanted, um, which helped. Um, that way they were asking some of the questions, not just me, and it gave me ideas too. Um, and, yeah, because you're going to have to convince at least three other people, so... <laughs> Don't make enemies. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, now, I don't want you to say anything that you can't say, but do you have any examples of cases of a grand, essentially grand jury nullification from your experience that you can talk about in detail or in great vague um, shades? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll talk about it kind of vaguely. There was a, a handful of times where we actually did do jury nullification um, one of them that I remember the most, there was a guy, he committed a crime. It would have been a misdemeanor, just a ticket. Um, but instead he tried to run away from the police. So, uh, ended up escalating it to felony charges. And I thought from previous tries of trying to get the jury to nullify stuff that they wouldn't there was no way that we were going to no build this case, but I was asking questions about what this guy does for his job. Um, and I found out that he was actually about to start boot camp to go into the army. And, um, I found out he also had some kids that were dependent on him. And so during, um, during all the questioning, uh, some of the jurors, you know, were like, well, yeah, maybe, you know, boot camp will be, better for him and uh than sitting in jail and then his family is not going to suffer and so i was really surprised because yeah we ended up no billing that even though he, he clearly broke a few laws you know? right yeah that's really interesting because um it kind of brings to light one of the disadvantages of um, the defense in the grand jury situation usually jury nullification depends on the jury having some sort of rapport with the defendant thinking you know thinking something sympathetic sympathetically toward them but you know so even I, I know a lot of people think oh i'll just get i'll just get jury nullification in my case because it was victimless but you really need to be likable to the jury if they if they don't like you they're not going to go out on a limb for you and yeah, in, most definitely <laughs> and, and in a grand jury situation you can't really establish that rapport with someone who's not represented so that is that's a very insightful um thing to do to kind of bring out those details about him right and actually something i forgot to say about that um i subpoenaed um his recruiting officer and had him come as a witness and talk about his character too. Oh, so wow. that, that's a good that idea. Helps a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One time too, 
um, and just made me think about that. I remember asking if we could, you know, do a little bit of investigation on our own and they wouldn't allow us. Wow. That is the exact opposite of how the grand jury originally began. (laughs) Right. Right. I I just had read Roger Roots' book too. And I I was shocked that they told us that, but I didn't really know what to, to say to them, you know, Yeah, you don't want to get kicked off (laughs) because that'd be worse than, that'd be worse than, you know, a worse situation. But, um, uh, for our audience, uh, Dr. Roger Ritz is one of Fiji's Board of Advisors members, and he has a book out called The Conviction Factory. Help me out, Eric, with the... Uh, That's subtitle. a really good book. <laughs> the Conviction <laughs> Cla- Factory, oh. The Collapse of America's Criminal Courts. And I'm actually, I hope that uh, in the few days I'll have an interview with him as well about that book. So we'll get into some more grand jury details then. Uh, but for now, thank you so much, Eric. Um, thank you not only for your ser- thank you for your service as a grand juror, <laughs> your conscientious well, service, <laughs> but also you've been a big Fiji activist as well, which I appreciate so much. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, no, I just want to <laughs> thank you for everything you do. <laughs> just want to extend this, all my all my uh, gratitude to you. Something I didn't mention is the prosecution actually recommends how the jury should vote on each case. And 99% of the time, the jury goes along with it. So we need more liberty-minded people to get on jury. (laughs) That's so interesting because, like, why are they bringing the case to the grand jury if they're just going to recommend that you know bill it? (laughs) Right. So (laughs) actually, now now that you've mentioned that, now that I'm thinking of it, I actually did uh, post a while ago, I think there was a, a little video done with it was in regard to one of these high profile um, shooting cases that involved police and, and someone getting shot. And I think that they suggested basically it was like a way in States that don't require a grand jury, but allow it. The prosecutor can either indict themselves, but like they can indict, I think it's called by information. I don't really understand what that term means, But they can uh, make an indictment themselves or they can take it to the grand jury. And in those states, it was kind of thought that taking some of these high profile cases to the grand jury, even though they didn't want to prosecute them, was a way to sort of be like, you know, mollify the public (laughs) into thinking, oh, we tried, but hey, it's the grand jury. They didn't want to indict. (laughs) I I could totally see that. But other Definitely. than that, it just seems very strange that the prosecutors would make a recommendation because if you're recommending it, then bring it. If you're not, then why did you even bring it? Right. So. Uh, that's what I felt. The, the whole <clears throat> grand jury has been taken over by the prosecution, and they're basically just using it as another arm of the state and to validate mm-hmm. you know, what they're doing. Well, yeah, definitely. I agree with you that we do need more conscientious, liberty minded people. And uh, hopefully this discussion has given some people some inspiration to get involved with grand juries uh, if they have that opportunity and and are able to do that. So thank you so much, Eric. um, And you've been a great guest. Thank you. (laughs) 